Hi everyone, my name is Clinton Dexter Neenhouse. I am the head naturalist with the Friends of Saxon Bog, uh, and thanks for taking some time to listen to my talk uh, entitled Citizen Science and Research American Kestrels in the Sax Zim Bog. So today we're just going to cover a little bit about the Sax Zim Bog for those of you who might not be familiar with this place. Um, but most of the talk is going to be focused on our American Kestrel Nest Box project. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history in the background, talk about a little bit about kestrel uh, conservation needs, and the basics of our project in case you were interested in trying something uh, at your location. Um, and we'll also share a little bit of the results that we've been collecting so far. So, the Saks Zim Bog Important Bird Area. I'll refer to this area as the bog throughout most of the talk, but the Saks Zim Bog Important Bird Area is 147,000 acres um, designated by Audubon Society and BirdLife International as a location with sensitive species or sensitive habitat types. All of our IBAs in the state and beyond um, are all designated on a list of certain factors like the birds and the habitat, migration stopover value, those sorts of things. Um, and they also don't offer much for protections. It's not like an entity owns that area. It's just been designated as important. For our organization, the Friends of Saxon Bog, we like to include a little bit more than that, a little more around 250 to 300,000 acres in the Saxon Bog. Um, again, extending beyond the IBA because there are smaller bog pockets um, or maybe unaccessible places that are still bog that are still important that are just outside of the boundary of our core habitat. So if we look on a map, Duluth is in your lower right. Um, this is the IBA. This is the outline of the 147,000 acres of the Saxon Bog Important Bird Area. Most people bird the sort of western third of this place. Most don't see it from top to bottom. And as an organization, here's the full boundary. This is what we'd like to include when we're looking at our citizen science ventures or just diversity in the place. This is what we like to include. Our organization, the Friends of Saxon Bog, um, work to support, promote, and protect the Saxon Bog through land preservation, education, research, and communication. Uh, this, uh, our organization, the Friends of Saxon Bog, was started in 2010 by Sparky, Dave, and Kim as a way to preserve the black spruce and tamarack habitats in this place. Um, the current uh, land ownership by the Friends is 524 acres, um, but hopefully that'll be growing soon. Um, and is quite a bit less than the 147,000 that is the IBA. So we are an organization that is sort of the, the figureheads, the, the people working to help promote and protect this place. So when you think about bogs, I don't think you think about kestrels. Um, at least I don't. When I think of kestrels, I think of prairies. So why kestrels and why the bog? The, the easy answer is that they are species in decline. Um, Long-term monitoring has shown declines throughout their range, whether that's partners in flight data or breeding bird atlas data at the local level or the nationwide level. Um, and even locally, we can look to our hawk watching data from Hawk Ridge and from Bethany Hawk Watch. Um, all of those places are showing decline to varying degrees. Um, regionally, the central United States and central east central United States are still doing pretty well, positive trends, but every place else, um, for the most part, is showing negative trends, which is not super. One of these reasons they might be declining, why American kestrels might be declining, um, is that they have prey needs that are also declining. They eat a lot of insects during the spring and the summer when they are feeding chicks or getting ready to lay eggs. A lot of insect populations are declining globally, and so that's an issue not only for the food chain, but also for kestrels, which do rely on insects at certain points of their nesting. Kestrels, though, are, are a cavity nester, and so they also have the interesting um, need of a tree that has a hole in it, which unfortunately is also declining. Um, where I grew up in southern Minnesota, a lot, of the old, um, a lot of the old windrows that farmers would plant between their fields are going away. Um, that means nests for red-headed woodpeckers or flickers or something like that are also going away, which means sore kestrels. Um, so they really rely on those medium-sized woodpeckers um, for nest cavities, excuse me. 
This is a map uh, showing the trend of breeding bird atlas data for kestrels in Minnesota. This is from Sauer et al. in 2017. Uh, and from their metric, you can see that from about 2.5 on their index, presently we're at about 0.75. So we've lost a lot of our kestrels in Minnesota for breeding. If we look at some count data, some, some data from Hawk Ridge, this is the trends from uh, 1974 all the way through 2019. But the most important section to look at is what's happening recently. So in the last 10 years, there's about a 4.3% decline annually in American kestrel numbers. From that peak all the way to now, it's been a pretty steady, constant decline. Bethany Hawk shows the same. This is their fall count data pretty negative uh, trend to their numbers. Um, this is kestrels per hour. So how many are they counting per hour through the years? Trending negatively. You can see a little bump here and there, but trending negatively overall. Spring data, I think, is a little yes, less useful for kestrels, but we'll look at it anyways. This is the Bethany Hawkwatch data. You can see that there's sort of all kinds of variability, generally tending positively. But one thing that's important to note is that uh, the kestrel numbers counted in the spring at Bethany and at the spring Hawk Ridge Hawk count, um, those numbers are quite a bit lower than the fall numbers, um, substantially lower in the case of Bethany Hawk Watch. If we look at the Hawk Ridge data, from the West Skyline Hawk count, you can see again, trending negatively pretty strongly. Um, you'll also note there's two gaps in the data, 2008 and 13 and 14. 2008, there was no count, and in 2013 and 14, the count hours were very, very low, less than 70 count hours that season, uh, or those seasons, which means that kestrel count per hour is, is huge um, and skews this data pretty strongly. So I've removed those data points, but generally speaking, negative trending data. Kestrels, though, like I said, are nice because they're cavity nesters, and they'll also use boxes pretty readily. So for us, it's really easy to put up a box on a dead tree or a telephone pole near some appropriate habitat and attract some kestrels. So our project started in 2015. Frank and Kate put up the first boxes in the bog. They put up 14 at the end of the 2015 season. The reason the bog is a great place for kestrel boxes is that there's diverse habitat types. It's not just bog but there are agricultural areas and open field habitats which kestrels use, but there's also sort of intermediate areas like alder swamps that kestrels will use or open bog that kestrels will use as long as they have some place to nest. And so since the original 14 boxes, this project has evolved and grown substantially. This is what the project looks like now. There's 47 boxes that are placed in the bog currently. Some of those need repaired, some of them need replaced. Um, this is a pretty busy map, so let's take a look at a shorter scale and get a little bit more idea of the habitat. So this is the north section of boxes in the bog. You can see there's not very many, but there's also not a lot of great habitat. The whole center there is all bog, all black spruce tamarack bog. Um, not ideal for us to access, also not ideal for kestrels to be using for nesting. So you can see where our boxes are placed often are around areas that are agricultural, uh, or are open areas. So on the west side, you can see boxes 39 and 40. There's a little bit of farming, a little bit of open land over there. Same thing with uh, the, the boxes placed along Highway 7 and the boxes along Saks Road. Alder Swamp, a little more open. They'll use those habitats um, as long as you provide them a place to nest. The east quadrant, pretty much similar to the west side. Uh, there's not a lot there, or the north side rather, there's not a lot of options for nesting in this area. There's some agricultural areas, especially along our coal road. The problem there is that there's not any access for us to put any boxes. Um, the, the telephone poles are not in a place that we can access them easily, um, and so it's, it's hard to put up a box in a place like that. So east side, not very many boxes. There are boxes that get used on this side though. West side, a little bit more ag, so we have a little bit more of a concentration of boxes, especially around Toivola there. You can see we've added three new boxes in that area just this last uh, fall. Um, so hopefully that will draw a few more birds to that area and take advantage of some of that bog, that open bog south there. That's Toivola Swamp, just sneaking into the picture in the, the left-hand side of the screen. But 
the bulk of the habitat, the bulk of the ag, uh, open field, traditional kestrel type habitat is on the south side of the bog. So you can see there are a lot of boxes here. Uh, a bulk of our boxes are placed on the south side because the habitat's great for them. Um, a lot of these boxes do get used. We have got some new ones in this area as well. So it'll be exciting to see what this will look like this coming spring and summer. In general, this project is volunteer run. So I'm staff, but uh, everybody who's collecting the data and things, those are all volunteers. Our season begins in late March, sometime late March, April, depending on the weather, where we're going to clean boxes and we're going to repair or replace boxes as we need. Um, when we're out looking at boxes, we'll take notes, you know, oh, this one's loose, so we need to fix it. We'll make those notes and then we'll do that in March and April. We do have a training session every year, uh, basically just to review last season, the season previous, um, and to review protocols, uh, make some updates as we need, those sorts of things. And then if we do have any new volunteers, we'll do an in-person training. Um, usually it's nice to get everybody together anyways, but especially for new volunteers, it's nice to show them what these boxes look like, where they are, how to use the GoPro, those sorts of things. And then we do provide some training materials that, in, that if you are interested in, in doing a Kestrel project uh, at your site or location, um, these two would be really nice to, to use. Um, the photographic timeline of Kestrels from Hawk Mountain um, is really awesome. It goes from age zero to 30 day old Kestrel nestlings, shows you their development, feather groups, that sort of thing. So you can help age birds if, if you're interested in banding or just learning a little more about their development. And then the monitoring, the, the Kestrel Partnership monitoring instructions there uh, are useful. We use those sort of as a baseline. We also took a little bit of influence from New Jersey. The state of New Jersey has a really good Kestrel monitoring program. They've got some good literature out there. And then we've made some edits um, that help us in our area because we're very different than those other locations that these um, timelines and these uh, instructions are, are really built for. Our monitoring season begins the 1st of May uh, and ends after all the eggs have hatched and we don't detect any new nests. Um, so that means after about the third or fourth visit to an unoccupied box, we'll usually stop monitoring it, say nobody's going to nest here. Um, if we do perhaps see a bird in the area, we might monitor that box a little bit longer because kestrels can nest fairly late, but usually, you know, at the 30 or 40 day mark, they're pretty much all done. They're pretty much in the boxes they're going to be in. For our protocol, um, we're monitoring our boxes once every 10 days. Pretty simple. Um, we're using a GoPro mounted on an extendable uh, metal post or metal pole um, to look into these boxes, record some video, and review that video. We're taking about 30 seconds of video or so the whole time. Uh, our data is collected and transferred to data sheets, and that gets uploaded to the American Kestrel Partnerships website. And so this is a pretty typical box for us, a pretty typical location, telephone pole on the side of the road near open old field habitat. You can see there is no predator guard on that pole. We don't put predator guards up on our boxes. You can also see maybe that this is a top open box. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but this is a pretty typical location for us, generally away from roads, away from farms, or at least a mile away from a farm because starlings are an issue for us sometimes. So here's the pole. This is what it looks like when we're out monitoring. Um, you can see that the GoPro fits really nicely into the hole of the Kestrel box, and we want to get the, the GoPro inside, and then we usually try to push it up a little bit so we can get some extra sunlight into the box to record some really nice video. Uh, because we want this. We want to see what's going on in that box. So this is a female. She's sitting there nice and content. You can see there's two chicks there. You can see the head of one and the feet of the other one. Um, this is what we want to be able to see. You can also see that she's not disturbed. She's going to sit put, sit tight, stay put, not really too worried about what we're doing because she thinks her camouflage is protecting her um, against whatever predator this might be. Most of the time, though, when you put the GoPro into the box, the females will flip over, show you their talons, and get ready to defend. Um, when they do that, it's really easy to count their eggs. We pull the, the video camera, you know, the GoPro out of there, and then we carry on with our days. Uh, without disturbing that bird. They usually don't leave the boxes. We usually don't know if they're even in there when we're monitoring, which is really nice. But the reason we do this, the reason we want to check the ages of the chicks or count the number of eggs, is so when we're banding them, we can be prepared. So this is the top-down view in a kestrel box when those chicks are getting ready to be extracted to be banded. And this is why we use a top-open box. 
Um, it's really important for us to get in to handle these birds safely. With a side open, you can see how those two birds uh, on the top side of the box there, they just tip right out if you had a side open box. Same thing with a front open, you get birds that would tip out. We don't want that. We don't want to hurt these birds. We don't want to disturb them. So a top open box works great for us. So what have we found out? What have we seen so far? Before we do that, it's important to know that this is not complete data collection. We're not uh, finished with this project by any means. Um, we hope to publish some initial results here in the next couple of years. So by the time we get five years of data, we hope to publish something about that and then continue on into the future. Since the protocols weren't the same at the start of the project to where we are now, we're only going to consider 2018 and 2020 in the following data analysis. And the number of boxes have changed over the years, so we can't necessarily compare 2016 to 2020. Um, just make sure that's clear. So in the Saxon bog, presently, uh, or for the first uh, three years of this data, uh, we had 36 boxes that were usable which means we could have more boxes up, but that's how many we're ready for Kestrels to use. Right now, we've got 47 boxes placed in the bog, and of those, 44 are usable right now. If we didn't change anything, 44 of the 47 could have Kestrels next year. Our boxes are mostly placed on telephone poles. Um, there are a few on live trees. There's one on a dead tree. Um, but this is pretty typical, again, no predator guard, top open box facing away from a roadside near appropriate habitat. We're about 10 or so feet off the ground, um, anywhere from 8 to 11 feet for our boxes. 11 gets pretty high um, for me to try to extract kestrels from these boxes when it's time to band. Um, so around 10 feet is ideal. And then, like I said, facing away from roads and usually south or east. So this data shows orientation of our boxes. You can see almost every cardinal direction has a box, um, but the east-south facing boxes are where the bulk of our effort has gone into thus far. So in the uh, 2018 to 2020 seasons, we've had five boxes that have been occupied every single year, so the same box year after year, and of those, two actually have been occupied every single year since the initial 14 were placed. We've only had six failures in that time, two predation events, three boxes that were just abandoned, one box that failed um, and led to an abandonment, so the, the lid of that box actually blew off, which is not great, um, so we got to repair that this spring. And since 2016, we've only had eight failures, so only two additional failures, one nest failure and one predation. So all of this considered, we've had really consistent clutch sizes throughout our uh, data collection. So this is uh, a chart showing you when eggs are laid by our kestrels in the bog. Um, median egg date, I think, is the most useful. So anytime around the 10th to the 15th of May, that's about when egg laying starts, or at least every box has had an egg in it. Um, you can see on the early end, April 11th is the earliest we've ever had eggs laid, which is incredibly early for us up here. Usually by then we still have a couple of feet of snow on the ground. And you can see the latest there, June the 10th. That was sort of an anomalous date. Generally, by the end of May, all the eggs are done. Uh, and you can see that kestrels, uh, that males arrive really early. So the reason we have to start so early in the end of March and April um, is because those males are already on territory or starting to scope out territories as early as the, the first week of April. Um, the earliest I've seen males is the 7th of April. Um, so we have to really, really get a move on once we hit March. Just generally looking at how many eggs are laid and how many chicks are banded, we're, we're sitting at about 4.7 eggs a clutch. We're banding 4.4 chicks uh, per those eggs, and then that's about a hatch rate of 94%, which is amazing. Generally, raptors have really low nesting success, um, so having these boxes where we have them is really supporting these birds, at least thus far. And like I said, we do band these birds, so the reason we're doing this monitoring this in-depth um, is that we are hoping to ban these birds um, in a reliable amount of time. Those bands, uh, aluminum bands, we're not doing any color banding at this point. We hope to, not doing any sort of uh, geolocator type transmitters either, just the old standard aluminum fish and wildlife band. 
And we want to ban chicks when they're at least 17 days old. Um, by then, most of the major feather groups have emerged so we can sex them, um, and we can usually pretty reliably age them once they hit 17. You can see our average is about 22 days old when we ban these chicks. That's a pretty nice age, and you can see our range is huge from 14 to 28 days, and we'll show you what that range looks like in the next couple of slides. Usually we'll have to do three to five different banding sessions in a season. Um, we try to maximize how many nests we band at one point. Um, makes it more economical for us, that means we don't have to take 17 trips up if we had that many boxes occupied. Um, because we have some very early birds and some late birds, we also get staggered hatching. We get um, different boxes hatching at different times, um, different rates of development in these boxes too. So um, usually three is pretty typical for us, up to five sessions in the season for banding. And while we're in those boxes, while the boxes are open, we're going to collect feathers, we're going to collect, uh, collect prey remains and pellets, um, any unhatched eggs, and we'll take a fecal sample from the boxes as well. But more on that later. So this is a, a kestrel who's pretty young. This is about as extreme as you want to get with kestrel nestling banding. This is a chick that's about 14 days old. And you can see a lot of those blue feather sheaths. They really haven't erupted much for feather tips. Um, it's nice because we had this bird in hand. We were able to look at it a little bit closer. And if you do look really close, you can see little blue feather tips poking out from the primaries there. Um, so this is a little boy. Uh, this is about as young as you want to band a chick. This is actually probably close to too young to band a kestrel. Um, ideally, this is what we like. Um, this is about 17 to 18 days old, this little girl. So you can see all of her feathers have erupted really nicely. We can tell they're all brown. Brown wings equals female. Blue wings equals male. We can also see her tail has erupted too to give us that nice female tail pattern. Uh, birds at this age aren't very active in the nest. Um, and so they're very easy to ban. They don't put up a lot of struggle. Um, you can reach in and grab them and put them in the bucket and then send the bucket down without getting scratched up or grabbed. Um, older birds, it's a little more difficult. So this is a nice, nice age here. And this is at extreme end. So this chick is 28 days old and she's ready to go. She's about ready to leave the nest. Um, again, another female, brown wings, and you see that nice tail pattern of our female American kestrels. Um, the reason we don't like to band it this old is that we're going to miss some chicks. Uh, so she was one chick in the box that probably had three or four that fledged before we could band them. Um, there's a whole story behind this box too, but uh, more than I have time to tell you right now. But a little old because uh, she's a flight risk, literally. Um, we don't want to disturb them too much at that time of year um, when they're just getting ready to go make their first flights. Um, so this is a little old for us, but we can do it. So when are we banding these chicks? Typically uh, sometime uh, late June, July, that's about when we're going to band the bulk of our nests. You can see we've banded as early as the 8th of June and as late as the 29th of July, and that's very, very late. That was a special set of circumstances again. I don't have time for it right now, but uh, you can see that the medians again sometime around the end of June, mid-July for um, the bulk of our banding to be finished or to be done. This was a really fun figure that I included because I had no idea what it looked like, what our sex distribution looked like. Um, in the last three years, we've banded 153 chicks. 83 of those uh, are female, so uh, more than half are female, which is really cool. Just a little quick summary now um, to get us thinking about what do these numbers mean, what do these figures all mean. To date, um, we've banded 192 kestrels all nestlings uh, in the bog. So that includes 2016 and 2017. But again, the bulk of that banding has happened from the 2018 to 2020, where 55% of our chicks are female. We average about 4.7 eggs and a hatch rate of 94%. About 45% of the boxes in the bog will be used in any given year. And typically our egg laying starts in late April and we have a median egg laying date of about the 10th of May. So data. So we're collecting some data. Uh, our volunteers collect a whole bunch of data when they visit each box. All of that data gets submitted to the American Kestrel Partnerships website. Um, they're uh, really working on a lot of really awesome things for American Kestrels, and we're happy to be working with them to submit data. I think right now we probably have the largest cluster of boxes in the U.S. that submit to the Kestrel Partnership. Um, there's 
places that have more boxes than we do, certainly, but um, we're submitting all those boxes to American Kessel Partnership, which is awesome. But I mentioned we're taking some biological samples. So the little uh, little envelope there on your right, uh, that's got some feathers in it. So we're taking chest feathers from our nestlings, from just one per, per box. Um, we're looking at any prey items, taking out prey items or pellets. Uh, we're looking at uh, new poop or old poop. We're scraping poop off boxes um, and submitting that as well. Uh, the Natural Resources Research Institute um, and the University of Minnesota Duluth um, have a few folks working on some master's theses, looking at raptors, looking at kestrels specifically, and, and a lot of this data is going to help them out with their studies, which is awesome. Um, I hope, uh, or I'm hopeful for the next uh, couple of years so we can see this data. We've been collecting some really good stuff for them, so I hope they've been able to use it well. But in, but in order to collect any of this data, we got to have people. So I, I do want to thank uh, Frank and David, um, who help band these birds. Um, Frank's the head bander at Hawk Ridge. David does a lot of the pastern banding and some raptor banding as well there. Uh, we bring David along on days where we got to band six or seven boxes when it's just too much for Frank and I to, to handle in a day. It's really nice to have an extra set of hands, and so really, really thankful for those two to help out. But we can't band those birds without our, mon mo our monitors, our, our nest box monitors. Uh, so Mary Jean and Sarah and her daughters have been started in 2016, right, when we started this project, when we did some more in-depth monitoring of our boxes. Um, Sally was with us for the first three years, um, and then when she couldn't take over her boxes anymore, Victoria and Kim popped in, so we've got a really nice crew. Um, Christina and I uh, are out and looking at kestrels when they show up. We're checking out boxes, we're repairing things as we need to in the spring, so uh, I really can't do any of the work in the bog without all these folks helping out with this project. And so now would be the time for questions, but you're just going to have to look at this little bucket full of kestrel chicks um, because I can't really answer your questions in this format. However, on the 5th of December, um, we're going to have a, sort of a Q&A session based on all of the presentations that you've been able to watch so far. Um, so December 5th, write down your questions. If you've got them, that's a great time to answer them. Otherwise, if you have questions for me directly, feel free to send me an email. Um, if you're curious to learn more about the Friends of Saxim Bog, if, if we're an organization that's not familiar to you, um, check out the website, saxim.org. Um, and if you want to learn a little more about kestrel monitoring in the bog, um, at the end of every season, I like to write up uh, how the season went. So on the bog blog. So if you go to the website and you click on bog blog, that tab, and search for American Kestrels, um, you'll be able to find all those uh, write-ups if you want to learn a little bit more. Um, so thanks everyone. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for uh, checking out my slideshow, my PowerPoint, and hopefully if you've got some questions, I'll be able to answer them on the 5th of December. Thanks everyone.